evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Big Chill 30th anniversary celebration. My name is Matt Coldrick. I'm a producer and composer uh, and coach, and I occasionally facilitate stuff like this as well. Um, I was lucky enough to perform at the Big Chill as guitarist with Fragile State and then my own project, Panelectric, uh, several times. And of course, I attended many times as a civilian because for a, a significant period of my young adult life, the Big Chill really was the epicenter of eclectic joy and counterculture. It was a unique, organic gathering and focus of arts, music and fun with a capital F. In many ways, it redefined what a festival was, influencing many events and new festivals in its wake. It had an amazing mixed community. And although a friend of mine once described it as the media industry goes to the country, it was an awful lot more than that. And it happened at a very, very important point in history because it was born alongside the internet. It was created, operated and curated by a generation of people who ran on their imaginations and a sense of DIY courageousness. In some ways, it was both the first and last of a kind because the influence of the internet has totally changed the way we engage with each other and with the arts. In fact, its lifespan meant that it served as a cultural midwife for a generation who saw nothing but possibility as we started our dance with the World Wide Web. And tonight, we're going to get a chance to talk with Katrina and Pete, who founded and parented this unique cultural event. And we're going to walk through a timeline of key moments in the Big Chill's life. Um, I'll be inviting Pete and Katrina to share their experiences, their stories, their motivations, challenges and aspirations throughout the journey. We met a few days ago uh, to talk about this evening and Katrina said something that really struck me. She said, the Big Chill was and is owned by everyone who ever attended. This gives you a very clear sense of the values that underlay every aspect of its short, beautiful life. And Pete recently reflected on its relaxed, eclectic nature because a DJ once asked if it was OK to play a Whitney Houston tune at one of the events and that the biggest security threat in its entire lifespan was a crowd surge backstage when the Wurzels played. Gives you a sense of what it was about. More anecdotes to follow, I'm sure, but we should start by letting Katrina and Pete introduce themselves, give us a little bit of background, perhaps where they're at right now, and also, really importantly, tell us when and how they first met. Katrina, would you like to start? I think ladies first is, is the way to go. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. I suddenly feel really emotional. I did as well, it, listening to that yeah, music. When, when seeing, <laughs> seeing the music, but more importantly, seeing such great faces that were like family for such a big period of our life. And not just family, people who just... Families don't always get on, but, but you know, we, we push so hard together to create these events that we may not see each other, but the bonds are there forever. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, and yeah, I think Big Chill to me was all about the people in the last few days as I've been reflecting. I can't always remember all the bands that played. I mean, there were hundreds and all the artists. But what came through really strong was all the people involved. And Pete asked me to write a list and it's just gone on for pages. So <laughs> I apologise now if we don't thank everybody. Um, do you want me to talk about how we met? Is Please. Mr and Mrs with Pete well, switch that's off the and then I switch off. That's the beginning, isn't it? I mean, the whole thing began when, when you two began and when you met and... Maybe also a little reflection on what was going on at the time, if you if you can think of you know the circumstances. But when did when did you first meet? When did we first meet? I think we met in about and Pete jump in if I'm wrong in about ninety one. Yeah, um, we're both passionate about music. I mean, first off, that was a bond, and I was working for a company um, that did mastering and audio production, and. I was asked by, I think it's Revolver Distribution. Pete had just set, just set up his new record label, set up Cooking Vinyl. And I was asked to drop around some masters to his place in North London. And I said, no, I'm really busy. I can't, I've got to go to all these other record labels. I can't, can't. And then I saw it was Pete Lawrence written on the thing. And the, I went to a convent school in Ireland and the only time I got thrown out of class was the morning after um, Pete had been interviewed on a guy called Dave Fanning, who was like the John <laughs> Peel in Ireland. 
And my friend and I, Yvonne, were just going, it's amazing. He recorded it on the campfire and the nun saw me and said, Katrina Larkin, get out of class now and stand outside. So <laughs> his name is kind of stuck in my head. So I saw it and I went, oh, this is interesting. And I went round and I knocked on the door and Pete and I started chatting and he asked me out. Ooh. And uh, we went on a date, actually. We went on a date to the local pub. And um, <laughs> and I think we just got on really well because we had a similar view on life. We were both very entrepreneurial. I would say we're both very stubborn, but fortunately it kind of worked together. And um, you can kind of say the rest is history from there. We just, we just got on and life yeah. rolled on. Brilliant. Pete, is that the truth? Is there more detail in there you want to add to it? I've heard nothing in there I can contradict, really. Yeah, she did, <laughs> she did turn up on the doorstep carrying a box of cassettes, I think it was, in those days. And I <laughs> threw out within five minutes. <laughs> wow. Um, so this is the first time we've been on a call together, first time we've been in the same room, other than a few social things we've done with the family in 20-odd years. So it feels a real... Um, privilege for me to be here and to see so many names from our illustrious past um, scrolling along the top. Um, amazing to see Justin Ede, Ben Middleton, Johnny Easterby, um, Steve Astronaut. Well, yeah, if I start naming people, I have to name everyone really, but really good to see you all. And we're here really, I guess, to celebrate those 30 years. Um, it's amazing how they've gone by as quickly as they have, really. But there's hardly a month that goes by when um, somebody doesn't get in touch and say, we still think of the big chills so fondly, or another marriage I hear about. You know, I think there are 50 at least that I've heard of now, marriages coming about through the big chill. Not all of them survived, but um, certainly there's been a plenty, of, plenty of time for people to uh, to work through how they met and get in touch and it's just been overwhelming actually to read the thread on facebook with all the reactions we've had matt there might be time to go through some of those um, as the session progresses sure definitely um one of the things i'm going to do is we're going to go through a timeline of of how the big chill evolved or all the key events and i'm going to get you guys to describe what was going on and and give us some insight as well into you know the backstory uh on the whole affair. But I also want to set a little bit of context. So before we do each year from 1994 onwards, I'm, what I'm going to do is just remind everyone what, what was happening in the world at that time of, of doing this and putting these these little sort of notes together. It, it just it was so good to be reminded of what was happening um, and just sort of contextualize the whole process. Because it was actually, I think, without getting too highbrow or philosophical about it, it was, it was actually a very, very important social event. There, there's lots of things that came out from this. Um, and it happened for many reasons. You could do all sorts of studies on this. And I, I know Pete's been um, doing some work on a, on a book around it, which is going to be really interesting to, to read. But um, let's just think about what was happening in 1994. Um, it's funny what you were saying, Katrina, about the circumstances before you met, because in 1994, the first women priests were ordained in the Church of England. So obviously there is a, a spiritual overtone, starting with you being hold off for, for watching an interview and um, moving on with the first women priest being ordained in the Church of England. Tom Hanks stars in Forrest Gump. Nelson Mandela is sworn in, first president of, of South Africa. Tony Blair wins the leadership of the Labour Party and sets up what he calls New Labour, which intertwines with the backstory through Club Together and some of the people that were involved in, in uh, socialising fun and, and making people sort of politically, socially aware. That's how I got involved as well. Uh, Vicar of Dibley on television, Rainbow Blockbusters, University Challenge, uh, Later with Jules Holland, That's Life, Jim Will Fix It, Paul Daniels' Magic Show, um, music, uh, debut albums from Oasis and Jeff Buckley, definitely maybe in Grace, uh, Underworld with Dubno Bass with My Headman, uh, Porter's Head, uh, R.E.M., Blur had Park Life. So you get a sense of what was going on at, around about that time. And the first big chill event, February the 27th, first of several monthly Sundays at Union Chapel in Islington. Pete, do you want to tell us how that came about and, and what was going on for you guys and, and what brought that together? 
Sure, yeah. We had, um, at the time, we had a magazine called On. I've got a couple of slides featuring that. And in a way, that was the, the scene setter for what became The Big Chill. It created a community, a, a scene around some of the articles and reviews. I could sense that there was a big thing happening with uh, Beatless music at the time. Club Together, which you've already mentioned, was um, was our house party. And we've got several people here who used to come to Club Together events, which we did in London in various uh, dodgy under arches of railway um, arches. And we did a couple in the Welsh borders. We did the first weekender at the Baskerville Hall in Hay and Y. Um, but there was a sense that, for me anyway, I'd sort of had enough of house music at that time and fancied chilling out, um, something a bit more social. So that happened to coincide with a guy called Martin Frost, who'd just taken over the Union Chapel. He'd been at Jackson's Lane Community Centre before then, and he invited me down and said, have a look at the space. And I immediately saw all the back rooms. Obviously, the main church, which holds a thousand, was amazing. And there'd never been any concerts there at the time. Um, but I thought we could do something in one of the back rooms, which is how we started. I think the capacity for the room was about 150, and we filled it with the first one. So this was February the 27th, um, 1994. Who who was the crew that you were working with there? Um, was it was it just the two of you that put that together, or were there other people involved in setting that up? We had Stuart Warren Hill, who's on the call. I think he was with us and um, his partner at the time, uh, Pod, SP Visuals. And in a way, they were pioneering for the full screen visuals. So we had, here's a, a fairly uh, low resolution black and white picture, but we had mattresses on the floor. Um, we sort of inverted the club concept in a way. So the central room was the most chilled out with mattresses on the floor. And then round the top, all those alcoves in one of them we had a brain machine in another we actually had a computer with internet which i think we were the first club possibly along with megatropolis to be offering uh, internet access and i think i can see the cake stall and the um the teas which um katrina didn't you bake a cake for the first one that we did uh, yeah i think in the very first one we had a very low budget very low budget but we wanted to make sure that everything was done with quality so um, we ran our own bar. We managed to persuade Majestic across the world to give us credit. I have no idea how we did that. So we were able to serve quality beers and drinks. And uh, we had a cake stall and our flatmate, Emma Ferguson, helped bake cakes all night so they were fresh and make sandwiches. And she ran that. And I remember looking at the screen that we had the screen and Stuart, you, you brought the screen in and everybody was terrified. Nobody would go and hang the screen up because of the height. But um, we got it done in the end with a guy called Jamie Dawson, who's no longer with us, who plucked up the courage. And I think it's him that we give credit for the visuals because uh, he climbed up there and actually managed to hang it on. And the mattresses actually came out of skips. <laughs> because we, did, we didn't want to tell people but a guy called Peter Stapleton his brother Peter went on to be our head steward for years and years yeah and then we covered them with um, fabrics but yeah I think everything was done with quality we didn't want to do anything substandard and everything at that very first event was like underpinned what we became like the food, the drinks, the cocktail bars, the visuals, the music, the interaction. That was that was the blueprint for what became the festival. Amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, were you the Big Chill then? Was it called the Big Chill at that it point? It was the Big Chill, yeah. We we did the, the monthly Sundays, starting about four o'clock in the afternoon and going through till about midnight, so eight hours. And we had a sort of continuous rolling ambient soundtrack in the main space. So you couldn't really tell who was live and who were the DJs. And I think that full Dislington Council, they were expecting something a bit more um, recognisable in terms of, you know, performance and audience. And they started sticking down white tape, didn't they? And where people could walk because we <laughs> very quickly attracted, um, well, we had 900 within a few months in the back rooms, which was bulging to capacity 
and Islington Council came in and knocked that down to 450, rendering the whole thing unviable at a stroke. Mm. So we had the, the first review actually happened literally the, a few days after the very first one. And it's David Toop, ambient uh, icon, who wrote it for The Times. He was a local a friend of ours from Crouch End. And uh, he got this in The Times, which was half of it is about the big chill and some lazy cop um, sub copywriter giving it a, a fairly lazy headline, New Haven for Neo Hippies, which I'm sure wouldn't have come from David. That's quite significant. I mean, that must have had a, a impact on people's awareness of what you were doing. It certainly helped in the press file. Um, not many of our fans read The Times. But, um, yeah, fair enough. To have it there as a first review was fantastic, really. And someone like David, with his credibility, um, was really uh, important. Mm -hmm. The next point that i've got i'll be moving on to 1995 actually i've got a little note here that says mattresses and condensation did you have health and safety issues as well as the the, the tape being laid down did they give you a hard time over that they did <laughs> i remember well um, <laughs> and mainly it was capacity and um, the use of the spaces everything from the decor they just couldn't grasp what was going on <laughs> Yeah. But I think it's worth saying that over the years, we started expanding more and more to the back rooms as well. So, um, yeah, so it just it just was it was uh, what was the word? Organized chaos. I think. Yeah. Beautiful. OK, 1995. So what was going on in the world in 1995? We had the BSE outbreak, uh, usual suspects film. Uh, O.J. Simpson was acquitted. Uh, Tracy Emin caused a stir with everyone I've ever slept with. On the television, we had The Private Life of Plants, Pride and Prejudice, uh, Father Ted, Friends, ER, uh, The End of the Tomorrow People, which was a tragedy because it was one of my favourite TV programmes ever. Um, and in the music scene, we had Bjork, Black Grape, uh, Lanis Morissette, uh, Blur, Radiohead and the Chemical Brothers all doing their butt bits. Um, the dates that I've got here, August 11th to the 13th. Now, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, so I'm going to get you to pronounce it, Pete. Uh, the Abergavenny event. Mysey Baron Farm, which is just outside Lantoni, which is midway between Abergavenny and Hay on Wye. But um, just going back, before that, we did an event called the Electric Picnic, which was Finsbury Park, part of the community festival. So that was just before the Black Mountains, which was the first proper big chill. We did one stage and we called it the Electric Picnic, which is interesting because um, an Irish festival picked up on that name some years later and I think they made it quite famous. And what was the uh, what was the nature of, of the event uh, near Abergavenny? Um, it says beautiful farm on your notes. Yeah, so here's the Black Mountains Gala. We um, we sort of dressed it up as a gala because we didn't want to ruffle too many feathers because the criminal justice bill was literally just coming in as we did it. In fact, the police turned up and read us a freshly printed copy, didn't they, Katrina? Yeah, and we had, I had to explain to them what it meant because they didn't have a clue. <laughs> they went off to uh, Brecon Jazz Festival and made loads of arrests and then came back and said... You're very organised. You've got computer records of everyone who's here, which we've never seen before. Uh, we also told a white lie because Changing World Distribution were running the um, record store at the time. Uh, and they, uh, there was a WOMAD sign and they said, oh, that's Peter Gabriel's event. Is Peter Gabriel coming? And I said, maybe. And they were huge Peter Gabriel fans. So they came back hoping to bump into Peter Gabriel. Uh, yeah, so there was the first postcard flyer review in a hammock on the site and then various different bits of artwork probably different people doing them actually there was a t-shirt modeled around this which you can still see mixed miles to morris wearing quite frequently <laughs> not sure he's washed it in the meantime but uh so here we are this is um the view from the camping field just above the camping field um taken by andrew cleal good friend of mine who lives in the hay. Um, so you can see there's just one main circus tent. Mama Lucas provided that. Um, and there was a cafe party tent, which had the food, 
and DJs um, non-stop round the clock from Friday to Sunday. So, um, yeah. How easy was it to um, recruit people to get involved? I mean, was it was it effortless? Was it everyone really switched on to what was happening in terms yeah. of putting these kind of events on? Talking about electric wheelchairs. Um, Ilka was saying. Can I just ask everyone to mute, please? Thank you. Katrina, do you want to... Um... I just wanted to point out that one of the key things here I loved as well, because it was the start of bringing in the art, was Johnny Easterby and his ice yeah. sculptures of the sound through the night. And um, that beside the... Um, there was a little river running. It was just absolutely beautiful with the lights and the trees. I think there were about 700 people turned up. But yeah. I absolutely think in the last 30 odd years that more people more than 700 people have told me that they attended it yeah but um regarding recruiting it, it 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 was lovely because it sort of spilled out from the indoor clubs we were doing and the people involved and um yeah and Stuart again was there doing the visuals with us with pod and lots of the early team and the sun shone and it was just this most beautiful weekend. The photos don't do it justice. I suppose you can, it's really hard to capture the, the vibe or the experience that was happening within the space. And Mama Lucas was also a circus. So we had circus performances in between, <laughs> in between the music as well, which we were hoping would help us with any licensing issues. But yeah, it was so magical that time. And the farmer would keep coming down to check in on us and he was a little bit shocked because we told him we'd only bring 200 people <laughs> and we had no security so me and the team would take it in turns literally of a pitchfork standing at the top of the road and these hell's angels turned up oh my god scary 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 stuff standing at the top of that road but um we got through it we got through it. I think the hell's angels took one look at us and went you lot are really boring <laughs> and, and <laughs> left the top of the road. We also had a convoy of ravers from Bristol who somehow mm -hmm. got hold of the email because we had a, a mailing list which was mainly, you know, people who were online in those days were mainly geeks, you know, and a lot of those geeks were electronic musicians and composers, so and ravers. So um somehow we managed to um persuade the ravers it wasn't a rave because I think Dougie, who's on the call, was from the gentle people, was doing a set called The Gentle Experience with the Karminsky Experience. And they the ravers pulled up and they could hear Joe Loss or Bert Camford or something and thought, oh, it's not a rave. <laughs> so we pointed them at Hay Bluff and they, they did, went and set up a rave there. <laughs> we carried, oh, yeah. on, <laughs> carried on with our lounge music into the wee small hours. So this is the, the, the team which was very, um, sort of came together quite spontaneously, some of it. Um, quite a few of the people here worked for On Magazine. You saw some slides earlier on. I um, just to jump in about the team involved in yeah. the beginning. That um, Three of the team were also dancers, professional dancers, and they were called Contrived and Exaggerated. So they would go and do, like, help with security and pitchforks, look at the clock and go, oh, no, we're due to dance now change into their costumes and run down, get on the stage, perform, and then go back out and be running the box office. And that was Mary Louise and Kate. Yeah, Mary Louise here on the left, and this is Kate and Robert, who was also with them. And the next picture is of uh, Wyndham, the farmer. He used to say, yeah, I'm Wyndham, half wind, half ham. He was um, an absolute star. He said, you can bring half of Greater London if you want. And then I think he regretted saying that when he saw 700 people. But he features on one of the Channel 4 documentaries um, from East North that we actually went back and did a little clip on the history of the Big Chill. And he, he's on there making some classic quotes about music. I, I don't like any music at all. I'd rather listen to the sound of the birds. So he was a true nature lover. And um, yeah, wonderful man who passed passed on a few years ago now. Bruce Bickerton and I happened to be there uh, on the anniversary of the big chill, and he passed away that weekend without us knowing at the time. 
while we were in the field. Was this the establishment of your core crew, this event? There were a lot of people there that stayed with us for the next few years. But, um, oh, here they are. Here's our <laughs> dancers We're running up, <laughs> throwing up the security yeah. outfits and jumping on stage. This is, I believe, an NME review from Ben Wilmot, I think. And this is Carl Loban from The Melody Maker, now the editor of DJ Magazine. And this is from On Magazine. Strange happenings. Strange happenings in the Welsh borders. And this is the DJ write-up, which was... Wayne Youngman and a few photos. We got Peter Quick from Ninja Tune, Matt Herbert, and um, Strictly Kev from DJ Food. Stuart Warren Hill was probably tripping when that picture was taken. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was a CD first. Mix we did for the Big Chill, which I did in 3D sound base at the time. Ah, we're moving on to the following year. 96. Okay, let's step through into 96. So what was going on in the big wide world? In, in mainstream culture, uh, Charles and Di got divorced. Spice Girls sell a million albums. Bill Gates uh, is calculated to be the richest man in the world. Dolly the Sheep, first cloned mammal and on television we've got tfi friday silent witness dalziel and pasco doctor who changing rooms this life never mind the buzzcocks um the simpsons i think the first time that appeared on uk television and in the music world uh in mainstream culture um beautiful south ocean color scene ash everything but the girl uh rem and um, films train spotting uh, Secrets and Lies, Muppet Treasure Island, uh, and Jude. And what was happening with the Big Chill? In July, programmed and hosted a stage at the Finsbury Park, Commun Finsbury Park Community Festival. Ah, now you've got that here in 96, Pete. Is that right? I'm just trying to remember whether it was just before, I think it was just before the Black Mountains, but I'm maybe wrong, actually, because Bruce Kent was involved and then we got him involved in this so 96 is possibly right i think it's in this little booklet which i think it was 96. let me check it's got a date in here hmm. yeah i've got it down as 96 in this booklet so that's probably right okay and then August, um, Big Chill Norfolk. Now, this was significant, wasn't it? Yep. Where do we start? There's pages and pages in my book when it comes out, <laughs> written at the time. Um, it was our first attempt at a licensed festival. It's probably worth kicking off with that. And we had um, a bit of a local reaction, um, which was, presented all sorts of problems. Um, tickets were selling really well. I mean, we had a fantastic lineup. Artists were coming to us, bringing us up, saying, Can we play? Um, just an incredible lineup, really, given that we'd only done the one event. So I think we'd sold a couple of thousand tickets before we started getting this sort of reaction. Now, this is the Dis Express. It's quite ironic the juxtaposition of will this festival be a rave next to an advert for Festival Fever comes to Dis. <laughs> On their banner. Um, oh, do you want to pick this up at all, Katrina? It's quite a long story. Yeah, I, I think in a nutshell, we were doing really well. And you've got to remember, in this day, people would send in checks. There was no transfers. You'd get the checks in for how many tickets and the name and address. It was literally just dealing with envelopes daily and running to the bank and putting the event on. But then we lost the original site. And we had to change the date. And once he said we were changing the date, letters started coming in equally, asking for people for their money back because they couldn't make it. So you, we were trying to deal with that. You've got to remember it was a really small team. 
and we had to apply for a new license and the council literally told us there was this one area of the fields which was not beautiful it was right by the town that they would sort of allow it to go ahead we got the license and it was just it was just appalling we had no fencing um we the, we the locals were running the bar we never saw the money from that it disappeared um it it was just everything that could go wrong and there was a storm leading up to it there were floods in the fields around it you know it was one of those times I think we did this we pulled well we sort of pulled it off had no sort of breakdowns I would say afterwards and then the council came to us and said they were taking us to court for being in breach you know after pulling us through all of this and we were utterly lost and then we got a call Pete, do you want to pick up from the call from Neil O'Brien? Yeah. I mean, is there anything else to say? Uh, we did pull off Norfolk, but we had such sound restrictions. Um, LTJ Bookham and Square Pusher, you know, who needed a bit of oomph in the PA, stopped, I think, in the middle of their sets because the decibel limit was so um, draconian. Yeah, and we had it to did go down on my phone as well, but if that's come back. Sorry, my could, could everyone mute, please? In the call at the moment. I think it's Ian, yeah. Um, so uh, we, we sort of pulled it off and people still say they, they had a great time, um, but it was <laughs> very testing. I think Katrina and I were the only two left picking up every last bit of litter on the Monday, which was one of the worst days of my life, I think, mm -hmm. realising we'd gone bankrupt. We, we were facing, well... There's a lot I could say about it. We couldn't even afford to put petrol in the car to get home, whilst everyone was saying they're going off with the takings. They're going to the Caribbean. You know, um, those sort of rumours go around. Anyway, um, out of the blue, the following winter, um, just after we'd been to court, I think in Norfolk, uh, five license conditions that we'd broken out of about three hundred, <laughs> and they let us off. Um, kindly, but part of those conditions were that we couldn't do an event uh, or if we did break any more license conditions at any other event anywhere in the UK, that case could be brought back in and we could go back to court in Norfolk. So we decided not to risk it. And then out of the blue, I mean, we were on the verge of going to America or just giving up and starting a new life, really. But we thought our days were numbered. The phone rang. And it was Neil O'Brien, an old friend of mine from Mean Fiddler days, um, who was running Brixton Academy, one of London's top venues. And he said, how are you doing, Pete? Have you thought of doing a benefit? I read about your, I think he heard the Kiss FM show that we did where we told the story. And within a couple of weeks, he'd um, organised to offer us Brixton Academy for nothing. And we then set about the task between us of calling artists. And we thought, well, we'll call a lot of the artists that played in Norfolk. So we had this incredible situation where we had about a dozen or so key artists um, who we hadn't been able to pay after Norfolk agreeing to do a benefit for us. So another event where they wouldn't get paid. And I think that was the confirmation we needed that we were loved, basically, that people really did want us to carry on. And even some of those who agreed, I think Matt Black said he brought along 12 records, one for every person he thought would come. And we opened the doors and um, we sold out at 5,000, which we couldn't believe as it was happening. So we knew then that we owed it to people to come back. Quite remarkable. I mean, that was the sort of the affirmation of, on a sort of spiritual level that this is this is you're doing the right thing. You're in the right place at the right time and people want this. And, and you know, in, in the background, um, there was a sense with the people that I was hanging out with uh, in London. I was sort of making trance music with a, a slightly different crew. And there was always a sense of daring about putting things on. You know, it's, it's, it, was, it was it was very much an us and them. And wasn't there some pretty drastic legislation that was brought in around about that time about people putting on parties? And um, it really felt like this was something that was aligned with what people wanted. 
and and in the spirit of the moment. And I guess that was the affirmation you were looking for. Yeah. Well, we did a couple at Brixton Academy. We did this, which was um, slightly less successful, um, but gives an idea of the sort of lineups we were putting together, moving in a slightly more jazzy territory. So we'd been very beatless and very ambient. And then it was beginning to really broaden out into um, drum and bass, into lounge, um, into world music, quite a broad selection of artists at this stage. And then we ended up a bit in limbo, really, after Norfolk. We did um, the Spitz in Spitalfields Market, big chill cafe. I found this advert today in an old copy of On Magazine. The people I night to the occasional table. Steve's here today. Sounds from the ground. Zion Train. Sidestepper. And then... Enchanted Garden. This is 98. Do you want to do your thing on 98, Matt? Yeah, I was just looking at a comment from Ken, actually. I, I'm intrigued by this as well. Um, totally DJ dominated. Were you bringing in live elements? I got involved in a couple of things at the time where myself and several other live players would play with DJs and we were experimenting with sort of hybrid mixes of stuff. Um, so what was happening with the big chill? Were you, were you, and what were you talking about in terms of lineups and, and how can you change it? How can you evolve it? I'd say it was probably about two thirds DJs and a third live. Um, much harder to get a live set up together and not many of them were doing live. I remember groups like Fila Brasilia playing live for the first time. Mm. Out of the second Enchanted Garden, wonderful set. Plaid were playing live. But they, they were still behind computers. So for people watching, you know, it wasn't like a, a show. It was a couple of men crouched over clicking their mouses. Yeah. I, I also think this is the first of the festivals where it was properly what the Big Chill Festival would become because alongside the music, you had the art trail as well, which was mm. curated by Alice Sharp. And the gardens just lend themselves beautifully, the landscape of them, for taking people on that journey at night through to different art, art installations. And Maria, who was on the call, was one of the artists at that first um, art trail. And uh, yeah, so we had that, but you, you could walk around the gardens and just like, if you didn't want to be in the club tent and dance, you know, you could go and lay out with the peacocks. By the way, the peacocks got addicted to nicotine. They would, over the years, start attacking people for their cigarettes, just a little fact there on festivals. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was just beautiful and it was conducive. But uh, as the years built, I'm just looking at the time, it became so popular. People were just climbing in over the walls, left, right and center, because it was just selling out so early in advance. But this is also the year, I think, when the team expanded as well. We'd been very DIY, we'd been trying to do everything ourselves. And I can't remember if it's a 99 and this was something... I kind of regret, but I was out of principle. The secure one of the security guards was selling wristbands on the gate. And I found out and I was, of course, livid because we were already dealing with so many issues of people jumping in. And I pressed charges. And isn't it ironic when you press charges, it meant we got in 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 um in trouble with the council again for being in breach. And, you know, even the policeman said, don't mention it, keep your head down, pretend it never happened. And I'm like, no, the guy's selling wristbands. This this mm. cannot happen. They'll go to another festival. So we were in trouble again for that. And that's when the team expanded and Fiona Stewart joined us, who has extreme wealth of experience and licensing, did lots of licensing at Glastonbury. Sharp cookie with the operations. And she came in and joined the team. And she helped build the whole operational side of it. So that was good. And that enabled us to keep going. Now, of course, must... now, of course running Green Man first. And um, running Green Man now really well, too. Which is not really you know, good. A lot of the chat says, what happened to the Big Chill? But I, I see the Big Chill everywhere today now at so many festivals. Yeah, and... I mean, you know, you guys were, you were the original boutique festival which every everyone based everything on subsequently you know it's as simple as that 
you're hearing the, the voice, voice. Hearing the voice of Mr. Bruce Bickerton, who's not showing his face. Hey. Well, uh, sorry, we've got camera issues here, but uh, uh, anyway, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, big, we're big, too ugly to be on. Exactly, <laughs> pick yourselves up. You, you guys, uh, you guys were the, you know, everything else that came past, you know, after this was based on, on the big chill, and you know, I can only reiterate what you're saying you know 98 99 they were the for me the best big chills there ever were they were it was it was fantastic thank you thank you thank you guys thank you Bruce. Hmm. yeah i mean we were, we were really blessed having the in the llama tree garden i think it was my friend andy cleo who tipped me off about it he'd been to the Lama Tree Music Festival, which ran for many years, and he said, have a look at the place. And we went there with our kids, didn't we, and had a look around one sunny afternoon, and we just knew straight away. It was a landscape by Pitt Rivers, um, Victorian pleasure gardens with little nooks and crannies and follies and perfect for the art trail. And that was really where the festival began to take shape. Here's a shot from the um, HQ. With Katrina in the front. We did it from 98 to 2002, so five years there doing Enchanted Garden. The final year was when we had a thousand people jumping the fence. So that was the year we did um, East Nor for the first time, 2002. In between, we did Lulworth as Lowell Hammond in the cap. couple of people on the call will see themselves at least three or four of you in that picture great shot i've got a pint of beer in my hand <laughs> that's some um, blair zacks who worked for the british council and harold budd the fabled ambient musician who left us recently he was a sweetheart played a great set as well when, when you started sort of expanding the operations side, that must have freed up a bit of headspace for the curation. And how did you, like, what were the curation meetings like when you're deciding lineups and I, I art think trails? Just just jump, sorry, jump, do it. It all happened so organically because it was just a melting pot of so many people that, um, uh, and it was an adrenaline, it was such a buzz that things would naturally, I would say, fall into place, really. I don't, I, I don't remember any big sort of arm wrestling <laughs> over tables or anything like that. It was just like, the, I think the biggest thing was trust in each mm. other, <clears throat> what they delivered, which I didn't realise at the time. But now, having grown another business, I realised what the big chill has that I had that I don't see in other big, large organisations was trust to the degree. You know, if Eugenia was running the record label, Eugenia was running, you know, if Fiona was doing art, she knew what she was doing. Alice bringing in her art stuff. It was, you know, there was a brilliant trust between people. How did you build that? Or did that grow organically as well? Because you, you started from the ground upwards. I think it was such a buzz and a magical thing that, you know, we became event junkies, really, yeah. to be quite frank. We loved it. And we had just attracted some amazing people. And it was a bit like a snowball. It just got bigger and bigger, you know. And in a way, time, it, when it got to East Nor and it was massive, and I love that. I actually, Pete and I differ sometimes, but that's great. It's our differences that made it so magical, almost that tension sometimes between us sort of debating what it should be but um you know just more and more areas I, I i could have added more areas all the time because there was always more people and more field the problem being that nobody would have been able to get around the whole thing and it was um it's worth saying it was largely still in in our house at this stage wasn't it the office it was only really around the turn of the millennium i think when we went into an office yeah well, when when the operations grew, we had to move out and we went down to Islington 
workspace for our first office and Victoria was there Hi and everybody. Yeah. Highbury area, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So then we um yeah, we started to look beyond the shores of England. Yes, ninety nine. Um and just a, a quick bit on what was going on in the world at the time. Uh, the European Union adopts the euro. Isn't that amazing? 99 that that was happening <clears> and all all the speculation around what that would be. Um, and then culturally, Buena Vista Social Club, which was the soundtrack to my midlife crisis, became really big. And we had uh, League of Gentlemen, The Naked Chef, uh, Queer as Folk, Smack the Pony and The Sopranos and uh, The Chemical Brothers hitting it hard with surrender and i've got on my list here that cairo opera house pete mm. yeah we did several things all within two or three years of each other we did three years in naxos which is next on my slide list and then we did um a landmark event in cairo with the british council which was um they spent their entire budget arts budget on that one event didn't they but it was a real success and I think the whole of the British Council knew about it, and it was in their magazine and everything. But Naxos was, um, again, I know quite a few um, things which have come from Naxos, including marriages and all sorts of artistic collaborations. The first one was had quite a story behind it, which was 2000. Um, this boat, on the night... We just before we started, the Express Samina um, hit the rocks outside Paros. Katrina had just, we dropped you off. I was with Alan James, RIP, and um, we dropped you off and you'd gone to meet all the people off the EasyJet flight in the middle of the night, not realizing what was going on in Paros. I didn't realize until the following morning that the captain of the boat um, had been too busy watching the football, Panikonithos, and had hit the Portes, which are just outside Paros. Matt can probably see them from his front door. Yep. And unfortunately, uh, I think about 60 or 70 people died from that disaster, but it was one of the worst in um, ferry history and um, for boating history and made the front pages of the UK papers, but it it almost cancelled the first Naxos. So you were with everyone at uh, Piraeus, weren't you, Katrina, for a couple of days? Yeah, I think others may have to join in here because in my memory, we were stuck on that boat for a very, very long time. We we got on the boat, the ferry. The ferry that was meant to sail. Yeah, yeah, and we didn't realise that anything was wrong. Again, this is before internet, and we were sitting there, and then people did who did have mobile started getting calls. Were they okay? Were they safe from back home? And we realised what had happened, and we weren't allowed off the boat. And then, and, we, and we, oh, it was just crazy. And then we had to give all the names in, and the crew were crying. And I remember myself and Victoria Burns, who programmed the mixed media tent and key to the big chill for many years. And I uh, went round and we asked people to give us their sarongs out of suitcases, you know, proper big chill style, decorated one of the areas. And I remember Morris playing for hours and we when we just got, kept going until we arrived at Naxos. And I will say it was probably the, one of the most hedonistic nights of my life when we arrived there, <laughs> having just sat on that boat for ages and seen people crying for loss. And the fact that had we been on that ferry beforehand, and we nearly were, that, that we could have lost our lives. And I remember wow. people just coming in, running in, and jumping in that pool. I remember walking in after the tension of being on the boat for days and just bursting into tears secretly in the kitchen until I could come out. I, I cannot describe those few days and the tension and the responsibility <laughs> we felt for everybody and what could have nearly happened. Yeah, very narrow escape. And it was so emotionally charged, as you say, when people did arrive. They either went straight to bed absolutely exhausted or they parted like there was no like it was 1999. <laughs> for the week. And I think that also set the tone for 
I'm looking at a few culprits on this call, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <just laughs> the leaving, um... Grief then became, if you want to go wild in Greece with the big chill, here's your week. It became very much, I remember one morning opening my door after four days there, looking out and the party still going and just going, will you all just stop? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in, in the chat, very good yeah. fun. as uh, Matt says in the chat, we'll never forget that boat trip. Yvonne says, we'll never forget that night. Simon Green, the long wait. We got Morris two CD Walkmans and he did a set in the lounge bar. Yeah, I heard about that. I was at the hotel. Uh, we did a, a mini party on the first night, which was pretty wild in its own way. But yeah, you can see the hotel. It It looks fairly sedate. By night... Every night for the next week, we went on till 6 a.m. around the pool. So it was, um, yeah, quite a, an intense thing. And here's a um, mixture of a few pictures from Naxos. Wow. <laughs> mm. Some amazing sunsets, that's Paros over there. <laughs> and um, some mad videos, which, um, who made those? Was it Stuart? I can't Stuart. Remember. Yeah. They're probably still online somewhere. We'll have to... Uh... I think Stuart's, uh, Stuart's on the call, isn't he? Yeah. Hello, hi. Hi, hey, Stuart. Hi. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, this was an experiment. In, I think I told everyone to do kung fu dancing on the beach in slow motion, and then later on that evening, I I, I put the the whole long film into my computer and I sped it up like times four or five times or something like that. And um, I laughed so hard when I played it back in the room, you know, before I showed it to anyone. I was just crying on the floor, <laughs> and then we then we 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 showed it. Yeah, it was great, and we got we, we played um we played some like really fast syncopated music, and it, it it went down really well. That was that was a highlight. Yeah, and look at that expression on Ulf's face in the middle there. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think the video the video is around. So I, I might yeah I could try and find it. Yeah, bung them in the uh, chat if you can find mm. them. Okay. So yeah, boys with their laptops. Tom, Gre uh, Tom Middleton Hefner and um, sure I can. Uh, there's one for you, Katrina. Yeah, just looking after Ulf like normal. Administering <laughs> <laughs> medicine. The pool floated at the centre of attention. Um, so this is Janie and Avril who ran the Body and Soul Enchanted Garden area when we moved to East Nor, up in the hill. And Avril went on to start an incredible festival in Ireland called Body and Soul. Yeah. Still going strong, I think. Is that right? It certainly yeah. caught up very quickly when we uh, introduced it. So started to bring some records out here. Yeah, what was what was the um, was it just an, an, a natural and obvious thing to do to set up a label, or was was there like a sort of a you know to, was that your initiative? Yeah, I'd done the compilation um, I Live Movies, and I'd done the first two Enchanted compilations with Tom Middleton, and um, I think when Bruce Bickerton came into the fold, his was the first or maybe the second album, can't remember, but Instrumental, who were a string sextet, doing covers of The Orb and Moby and Eno, uh, made a wonderful album, and they played at an early Enchanted Garden. And then we just did um, at least one a year after that. And some artist albums as well. We had Lowell Hammond and Eva Abraham, um, AGK, and a couple of other artists, Yam Yam, Guy Morley. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, a uh, humble musician, it was a total dream come true to be sort of um, signed to the label that was um, doing all the festivals that I was, you know, really into. It was amazing. So, again, thank you very much. <laughs> 
I never forget the first time I heard your track at 6 a.m. <laughs> at the first uh, Naxos. Um, I'm not bad. Check check out I'm not bad by Lucid Nation. And that was what got me to sign you. So Big Chill Forum. <laughs> How many people here? Quite a few who were on the Big Chill Forum, which in its day was um, you know, this was we're talking almost pre-Facebook here. It was the place where everyone congregated, really. Or most of the people I knew who came to the event, but quite a few who didn't come to the events. And it had a life of its own. There was advice on everything from what food to to cook through to how to deal with relationship problems through to even some of our events got talked about occasionally. Um, it was just an amazing space. Purple power, as Harry Walker says. Um, so, yeah, the golden years of the Big Chill Forum. Somebody described it as social networking 1.0 at one point. And um, had various people running it. And Chris Burford ended up being quite, um, doing quite a few years looking after our forum. Rui, of course, who was in the office. Various others, Dom Gregson. Who's on the call, Mark, good friend. Yeah, Barkey. yeah. I'm just looking at the, uh, the the general chat thread there, and there's um, post a nude picture of yourself. I mean, what what the fuck's that all about? That was you, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I thought that would attract your attention, Bruce. I was waiting. It's your bait. <laughs> so quick. So we did quite a few gigs in London as well. Probably one of the most notable was the wonderful. I think we did three with Tom Middleton as Amber, but with the Joyful Company of Singers live, two nights at Union Chapel, the second year, one night the first year. And we had Piano Circus as well, guesting. Still got people coming in. Um, Superb. So we're up to 2001. Yeah, it's a little bit blurred here in the slides because it's jumping around with some of the events in different places. So I think this would have been 2000 or 2001. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the big wide world, we had race riots in the UK. Um, the Eden Project in Cornwall opened up. Uh, outbreak of foot and mouth. On television, we had um, two pints of lager and a packet of crisps. The Office, I Love the 90s, Friday Night with Jonathan Ross. And in the mainstream music scene, we had Stereophonics, uh, Pink Floyd, my goodness me. Um, debut album by Blue. And The Big Chill starts to tour the Antipodes, Australia and New Zealand. So you're still growing. You're still growing. You're getting bigger, bigger numbers. You've set up a label and you're going further in the world. There's the fly from the out. New Zealand. There's the fly from the New Zealand event actually in Auckland. And a few slides. Apologies for the images, by the way. I cobbled together. I've hardly got any on my hard drive. And I was literally just taking pictures of a lot of the stuff in the booklets and grabbing what I could today. So this was the Australian tour, which was 2001, possibly, which Katrina came on with us. Quite a lot of fun. Yeah. There you are. In um, Yelling Up, I think, that picture is taken. And there's us in Low Earth, which was 2001. We did one event there, Low Earth Castle. Haven't really got many pictures from it. I think Lulworth again, when we moved site to Lulworth, we went to about what well, was small in comparison to where we went, but it was at 7,400, but it was just a beautiful site. And yeah. it was an event that just worked. And, uh, and, and it was quite, uh, we had the art trail up in the woods. We had a really big body and soul area. The visuals on the castle looked incredible. It was such a playground for a festival for us. And uh, and, and lots of crazy stuff happened, like uh, a speaker caught fire during Cruder and Dorfmeister's set. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it was when we did the first film where we got people to participate with Caro, with people jumping out of 
plant flowers. Yeah. Was yeah, like, I yeah, think Long Worth like, goes down as one of my favourite festivals with the big chill. My, um, yeah. Mark Fuller's just said the art trail at Lulworth was fantastic. Uh, why did we only do one event at Lulworth? Um, I can't remember the reason, but we 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 discovered Eastnor, I think, and that was very appealing. I was invited up to Eastnor, and uh, immediately it worked as a venue. The flower video, yeah, Mark's just put the um, the link in YouTube. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, British Council, Cairo Opera House. We touched on that. We're going to have to fast forward through this because we're it's quite a lot to get through still. Yeah. Some middle. Were you months. were you concerned about the fact that it was getting so big? Were you starting to sort of think and feel that this is becoming unmanageable, or was your appetite endless? My appetite was endless. This is where <laughs> the thing <food> jumped in. <laughs> No, it wasn't put more people in front of more one stage, never. Mm. We really, it was like, I felt like I we'd run away and joined the circus. Mm. And we were, you know, like all the things you're calling out, which were happening in any year. No idea about any of those. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, why I'm so is that, interesting. Is that what I was going? Because we were creating our own alternative world which celebrated artists and it wasn't full of corporate shite, if you excuse my language. It was about the quality of the brilliant people coming together. So in my mind, if you could take that bigger without exploiting it, that was a beautiful alternative and a great fingers up to the commercial yeah. world. And that, that relates, relates to a question that Steve Willard sent in. He said, um, when was it that you both realised that what you created was so much more than the sum of its parts and how did it feel? And that was it for me. It really felt like extended family rather than just doing more events. It was like so many people involved in different ways. Um, it was just brilliant to see so many people coming in and, and showing their diverse talents. And he also says, this is Steve, they're doing the eighth year of Together. Um, they were doing Festinio as well, so a little plug for the eighth year together. So this was very few pictures of Cairo, but there was a brilliant film made for Channel 4 by Mark Silver, great filmmaker that we work with, Yeast Productions. I don't think he's involved in Yeast anymore. This is me de looking very serious DJing in um, Cairo. And there was a review by um, Tobias Peggs, which went in one of our programmes. One of the few reviews, I think. So we're on to Eastnor. Thousand people who can't get tickets jump the fence. That was the last Lama tree, which was, yeah. So that's why we went to Eastnor in 2002. Okay. And we slightly overestimated the numbers or slightly miscalculated, which ended up in us selling 50% of the brand, having to sell 50% of the brand. Wow, that's significant. Well, given that we were growing exponentially, it felt strange that we had to do that. You know, it was probably a difference of about 50K, if I remember correctly, that we were it sure. Was, it was all done on a wing and a prayer. Yeah. There was no big cash investment, so oh. it didn't take any much to sort of turn the dial the wrong way. Mm. And we needed cash investment at this point. But you didn't lose control, so, did you, in terms of, you know, the basic running of the whole event and the decisions, the creative decisions, or did you? No, but I think when you bring in any investor, you know, you're selling them a dream. And you mm -hmm. and you're giving them ownership, you know. So you have to listen. So in the beginning, it takes time. It always takes time for new investment and new structure in a company to sort of find your way of working. Mm -hmm. But um, it it did change the way we worked, yeah. But I mean, it, in, it, in, it in enabled us to continue as well. In, um, in retrospect, would you say that Chris and Nigel were? The right people to bring into the mix or 
I think I personally think we were really lucky that we had them having uh, having now sorry not going on sidetracking got gone into lots of other companies investors and deal with it daily you know I, the big chill was so passionate in our family it was it was hard to sell and I personally looking back think it's incredible that it was Nigel and Chris and mm -hmm. it did continue all those years because it could have been a different story I was with Nigel last night at dinner you know um, I have a, a I personally see them and have a a lot of time for them. We had three choices at the time, and it was interesting that the Cantaloupe Group were the only one that wanted fifty percent, and the others wanted fifty one. So that swayed us, but we also liked them as people as well. And um... and you know they had a fantastic venue in Cargo. I mean, yeah, that and really was great. And Chris, with his history in music. You know, he understands artists, is passionate about music. He may not yeah. always look at things the same way, but they would, you know, they were definitely the right people. Plus, it enabled us to open bars, you know, yeah. to be able to have a big chill home all year round. So you weren't just meeting one time every year. It was like a great place to try loads of music always, every day. Yeah. And to be fair, they could see it still growing exponentially. So they really did allow us to continue on the same path we've been on pretty much. But as Katrina says, you know, when there are two extra people also guiding it, then you have to be very much mindful of that. So the various slides of, you can see the, um, again, the sort of untainted beauty of the location in East Newcastle. Um, and the fact that it had the hill, you know, the big hill as it was um, nicknamed, which was a struggle to get up if you had a lot of camping stuff with you, but the view to sit on this bench. I'd always gone for sites where we had enough space to be able to sort of retire into a quiet bit rather than characterless showgrounds or event sites where you're sort of herded in and you've got fences all around. You know, there was lots of space where you could walk up in the hills here. And it really was quite a glorious sight. <clears throat> what year was that? So we started in 2002. And that became the Big Chills home from then. I did up to 2007. And I think the event continued after I left up until 2011. With a couple of changes as well to the management after I left. So, yeah, the lakes, which Fiona was warning people off that because you could get Viles disease if you went to the lake. So, I think, I think Party Marty ran the croquet uh field near there. I, I remember turning up on a Thursday and he was mowing the lawn ready for croquet. I, this site was brilliant because it really gave us the space to open up again to more ideas. We brought in fun fairs, there weren't fun fairs that festivals at this point and really expand on the whole food which we loved and the body and soul area art trail the fancy dress tents that yep. tests ran um the church yeah, and the church but also we brought punch drunk you know it's the first time that punch drunk ever did a big production was mm. at Eatnor, and we kept it hidden on the hill and then people found out so it, it was to me it was just like the 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 best years of the big chill the freedom and it we did this thing called big chill is spaces where people could apply to have their own space at the big chill that we would give them a budget for and that was lovely as well because it just got people so involved and it brought new ideas in i think that's where the disco shed started and the minuscule of sound was, was that there i think we yeah. had the sound as well yeah so this was the crowd for Norman Jay, who became an absolute Sunday lunchtime institution. Always brought yeah. the sunshine with him. Yeah. And of course, the leave no trace. And people, you've got to remember that Xavier, who went on to do Secret Cinema, was programming as well, some of the stuff. So I saw some of the comments like, bring back the big chill. I, I just keep going back to the big chill is out there. You know,
yeah, nestled right into the Malvern Hills. God, I'm almost getting teary eyed here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good blast of nostalgia. Fucking mm. right. I know, I genuinely miss it. You know, it was yeah, it was, an annual, it was an annual gathering of the clans, you know, simple as. Yeah. You know, if you hadn't seen people for, for the last year, you knew that your your mates would be there at the chill. And mm. yeah, incredible. I think audio visually we started to come into our own very much here. I don't know if Stuart wants to offer anything, but John Rickson, I think Sarah's on the call today. So who was well, coordinating our VJs, did an amazing job. I mean, for me personally, obviously you've just seen, I was there at the very beginning. I was there at the, at the inception of you, Pete, right? And um, I ended up playing to like being headlined to lots of 20,000 people here. It, it, it was a totally amazing thing. I really miss it. You came and yeah. stood on the stage with us. Do you remember when it was our 15th year, Stuart, the three of us walked out? I always remember that as a really yeah, special yeah. moment. And the great thing for me was bands like the Bays, you know, who grew out of the big chill community, you know, and would charge us a, f a couple of grand in their fee, maybe for a Saturday night headline slot, you know, which was just economic sense. And they loved it. You know, and they were playing to like Stuart playing to 20,000 people. A bit cheaper than Orbital then. <laughs> a bit cheaper than Orbital probably. And also bands like, you know, off, offbeat bands like the ukulele orchestra of great britain who'd be playing to ten thousand people in the field doing an eight ukulele version of le freak so that's norman jay's crowd sunday lunchtime they had to be hosed down by some of the stewards on the hot days because it got quite uh, quite full on there and there's our kate playing piano you can see the size of the crowd in the background kate was one of our compares on the call today, I think. It's wonderfully eccentric, good... isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a great example of English eccentricity. It was Norman's crowd in 2008, probably his peak, I reckon. And that was on the thread on Facebook. Thank you, Paula, for posting that. How did you get the aerial pics, Pete? There were no drones then, were there? I'm not sure where they came from, actually. There's our booth. Yeah, you know what? I've, uh, I still wear that top on a regular basis. <laughs> Have you washed it, Bruce? <laughs> of course you did. No, I know. I've not washed it since. Uh, this is one of the Kayleys we did on the Village Green stage, which came in after a few years there, which was wonderful. Jerry Dammers doing his Sun Ra big band. And John Peel, who this was his last ever set. Um, a couple of months before his untimely death in um, South America, in Peru. Um, he insisted on playing the really small bar because the, the year before I put him on the main stage, uh, which worked fairly well. He was very quirky, as you'd expect. What's the status quo, if I remember? Well, status quo followed by hardcore gabber and then a yeah. stop wheel, you know. Um, but he insisted on playing. He said, oh, can't you put me in one of the small bars like Charlie Gillett plays? So we did. And there was probably another security alert or two people rammed in there. Uh, it was his last appearance. And in his book, Margrave of the Marshes, he's incredibly uh, effusive about the big chill and bringing his family to the big chill. It's great to read that. You had your book coming out mm -hmm. at that time as well, didn't you? Crossfade. Yeah, there's the security alert band that prompted them. Um... Oh, yes. <laughs> the Wurzels. The Wurzels. Me and Moses... Um, the venues, Big Chill Bar, Big Chill House, we touched on those already. Here's Crossfade, it came out, I think, in 2004. A chapter written by different people, loads of different chapters. DJ Derek wrote a chapter, Mixmaster Morris, um, Hildegonde Rietveld, Susanna, Guy Morley, Alan James. Um, get hold of a copy, there's still a few around. It's a good read. 
And there's me going back to the uh, the original site of the Black Mountains. Then Goa, 2007. What were we? What was the world doing in 2007? Matt? Um, David Tennant, Doctor Who. Uh, Finding Nemo and Shrek Two, Celebrity Big Brother. Top of the Pops moves back to BBC One. Teletubbies returns to the Manor Born returns. Uh, biggest selling albums: Amy Winehouse, uh, Back to Black, Leona Lewis. Uh, and take that beautiful world. That's still a great record. I don't care what anyone says. Is that a fave, is it, Bruce? Oh, God. It's on constant rotation here. <laughs> and of course, Amy Winehouse played her first festival at the Big Chill. Did she? I didn't yeah. know that. Played to about 500 people. Um, she was largely unknown. She was the last person to be added to the bill. A friend of mine just rang up and said, Saw this great artist in Camden last week, sent me a tape and um, seemed right for that slot, which was the first slot on uh, Saturday, I think. And so these are various pictures from the Big Chill Goa, which was a wonderful event. I went back to the beach where we did this a month ago and it's completely changed. It was a coconut grove and really quite wild and um, not built up at all. Now it's just full of hotels and bars. So we had a wonderful crew as a daughter and son. Wonderful crew just working on the decor and taking every single coconut down so we didn't have anyone getting a coconut dropped on their head. And some of the lighting was uh, was fantastic. Anything you want to say about Goa, Katrina? It was hot. <laughs> As were the curries. Yeah, it was a tough event to put on. Yeah, it's it was brilliant. a really tough event to put on, and um, I think you know that it was organ. A lot of production was organised locally. And um, they were bringing people in from the villages to help us. I remember when we were falling behind and I was going, we're falling behind. And they said, don't worry. And next morning, these villages and their children arrived really early. And I remember just being absolutely appalled and just wanting to stop working on it. And I think Ulf was there and a couple of others. And they set up kids workshops for the families who had come in so the kids didn't have to work. And the parents were just absolutely delighted. So, yeah, that was my main memory, all those kids coming in in the back of the lorry and thinking how different the world was out there. Yeah, it reminded Amazing. me of a question Aileen Redett asked um, to both of us, actually. Who turned out to be the biggest surprise in terms of you thought they might be tricky, but they were lovely and vice versa? And I thought of that because of one artist in particular in Goa, but it was almost the other way around with him. Um, he's left us now, but Jose Padilla, I had to, I thought he'd be lovely and he turned out to be incredibly tricky because he was hanging out with um, Jay Jagger and, and it took me about three hours to persuade him to actually go on and play his set because he was so off his face. And he did actually ring me up and apologize a couple of years later, which was part of his rehabilitation program, I think. Um, but in terms of people who turned out to be lovely, um, too many to mention, really. But I'm thinking of people like Terry Callier, Harold Budd, Hans Joachim Rodelius, um, George Hatsis, who I thought had died in the Paros Ferry disaster, who's a wonderful Greek musician. I Googled him when I discovered a track that we put on one of our compilations. And the only George Hatsis I could find was in the Paros Ferry disaster. So I thought, oh no, I've discovered this artist and he's died. It turned out to be another George Hatsis. And George was alive and well and came to Eastnor and brought me a wonderful Greek traditional instrument when he came. So what about you, Katrina? Leonard Cohen. Absolutely gentleman. 
And remember, we had set up, we wanted the backstage area for him set up exactly like his sort of lounge at home. So he had like what rag, what carpet. So I thought it was going to be really difficult. And I walked to the side and I was trying to, to had to walk past his sort of dressing room area and I wasn't going to go. And he came out and saw me and he bowed in front of me and lifted off his hat and said, thank you. And I was just like, oh, wow. And then the other one would be David Byrne. Um, met him. Everybody knows uh, he's my secret. He, he doesn't know it, but he'll marry me one day. But anyway, um, I actually was sort of following him. And then when I first met him, Guy Morley said, I've never seen you nervous in front of talking to somebody. And I met him later and we ended up having such a laugh together for about 20 minutes. Once he did, had done his show, he became a completely different person. So, yeah, David Byrne and Leonard. They didn't, they didn't have to give. They're up there, but they just gave. And they were brilliant men. Yeah. This is the Bays from Goa. Sheila Chandra. It's great to be able to take her over there. And yeah, I'd left by this point at the end of 2007. So I found a few um few flyers online. They're the people you're talking about. some of the artwork for the later events. You remember that we had the, at the end, we started doing the big burn, the sculpture at the end on the Sunday night. And I also remember it was at 2009. And David, we tried to tell David Byrne when you're doing burning down the house, we actually have giant house, you know, have on wood and we're going to set fire to it. But of course the mm -hmm. message never got to him and any side of stage and we're telling him, I've never seen a man get so excited and jumping around and going, oh, my God, we're going to do this. We should have done that. Yeah, that was a magical moment for me when that was burning and he's going, look at that. Listen to me. There's a message in the chat from your daughter. Stop going on about David Byrne, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. It's slightly <laughs> obsessive. <laughs> Mark Fuller, stand up for me now. Nadine saying she flew in from San Francisco to see Leonard Cohen, the big chill, two of my favourites of all time together. World famous, says Mark Fuller. And then um, the last one was, yeah, well, controversial headliner. Um, I didn't actually go to this. I did go to a couple of the ones after. I, I, well, I wasn't at this either. Yeah, uh, uh, lost its soul by that point, really. Which it um, was, I think you, 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 it was. It wasn't, you know. The can said the big chill, but the product was completely different inside. Yeah. Well, Melvin did actually ring me up and um, ask if I wanted to get involved again when it started going off the rails a bit. But by that point, I'd made my exit and uh, didn't really show too much enthusiasm. Although um, Mr. Scruff is playing, which... Well, there are some, you'll find some of the regulars, I mean, Tom Middleton, Norman J, Mr. Scruff are in there, but there's a lot of artists I've never even heard of, actually, on that bill. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, my programming was was certainly quirky. And what was this all about, Katrina? Yeah, Spence, uh, Spencer Tunic, it was a protest against BP at the time of the oil spill, and Spencer Tunic, I'm sure most of you are aware, um, does a lot, what's it called? Uh, nudist art, naked art in places like Sydney, and key landmarks, and I persuaded him to do one in the middle of the big chill. And the colours represent to do with the, the oil spill. And um, did a quick Google. There are other big chill festivals out there now. There's an <laughs> if you want to go to one. <laughs> yeah, go to Australia. It's Armydale Sports Ground. Or you can go to the big chilli festival at East North. And there's one called Lake Fest, I think, that's attempted to take our place. We've got loads of quotes in. I don't know if we've got time to read a few, Matt, but here's the one I picked out, which is um, from Norman. Best and most iconic British festival ever. Thanks again for giving me simply the best and most unforgettable DJing moments of my life. Norman Jay. 
There's, there's a lovely personal one here from Matthew Gibbons. Some, some of the finest memories of my life and friendship were made uh, there. It was an event that became a must go for me and my closest friends year on year. And I'd avoided for years going to a festival with any consistency until I discovered the glorious Big Chill. It represented everything I loved about music, the artists, the values, the family, the feel good vibe. And every time I went, I invested in the talent that performed and checked out the artists live thereafter. From the Norman J sets, which were absolutely incredible, to Mr. Scruff's tea shop, to the stunning beauty of East Nor, I loved it. That's beautiful. That's such a nice, such a nice thing to say. You brought a huge number of people together. You really did. Well, that for Thank me you. was always the the thing I enjoyed most. Really, got the most satisfaction from just seeing the connections made. So many memories, uh, James Gross. So many memories. And for me, and I know for many, the Big Chill broke the mould and created the Blueprint Boutique Festivals as we know them today. Not only those, but it was the birthplace of Tangerine Fields, the company that created pre-pitched camping, which quickly turned into boutique camping. The Big Chill had so many firsts. That's something we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Pete, actually, was the, the, the number of firsts that uh, that came out of the Big Chill. is quite phenomenal. And that's kind of a testament to what happens when you let something grow with love and grow organically. You can't you can't blueprint something like that. It just has to happen. I, I think it's when you care about the people coming and we never saw the audience as the word audience. Mm. The, the philosophy was we were inviting people into our space and we wanted to host them. You know, you don't invite people for dinner and give them baked beans on toast. Well, I, I try not to, but, you know. <laughs> you, so, like, you know, even in the beginning in the food, I remember there were no food stalls. And I went around Camden Market uh, trying to persuade food stall holders to come and do a festival pitch and calling up restaurants. Everybody thought we were crazy, but we did persuade a few people. And, you know, we were young. I was 24 when we started the Big Chill, thank goodness, which meant I was really young and stubborn and thought you could do anything in the world. Would you do anything differently? If you did it again, any regrets or any yeah. sort of major tweaks that you'd? Yeah, definitely do it different. Uh, the thing I would do different is have some breaks and holidays. It was so intense. Mm. I think by the end of it, we 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 weren't looking after ourselves enough mm. as people. So we we're burning out. It's a bit like artists have managers or people have people. I remember I was I was burning on nothing towards the end and that's kind of I think when I look back where decisions happened where I wasn't stepping far enough away to look in to make the right decisions because you're just like on this treadmill all the time so sometimes I've learned now in life that you need to slow down to speed up yeah and and it's kind of ironic that the name is the big chill and I think we didn't slow down enough to to look at what we were doing. Yeah. That that is my only thing looking back. But hey, I don't really have any regrets really to have yeah. been a part of this. Like still looking at this, I can't believe I was a part of this. How how lucky, how lucky are we? Astonishing. Mm. It was an amazing um, just, uh, tour. And um yeah, in some respects, um you know, maybe cost us our personal relationship in some respects because it was like a very demanding third child um, that sort of took over, really. Um, but it's great. Just seeing a quote from David Flower, Big Chill became a hugely influential and much copied template. Um, I think it was that, yeah, that copying that we see now in a lot of other festivals. I don't know how much it's changed the, the face of festivals. I felt at the time we were doing that, but looking back now, there's still a lot of very commercial festivals, but many, many more events than there were then. Just looking at the list of artists um, that you sent me earlier, Pete, from memory, this is not even the official list. This is just you thinking. I'm going to start reading them. Maybe we can use this as your play out credits just to give a sense of the, the number of artists that played here. Global Communication, Mixmaster Morris, Cold Cut, Pete Lawrence, Norman J, Laura B, Max Richter, Zero Seven, John Peel, John Hopkins, Cinematic Orchestra, Lily Allen, Goldfrap, The Egg, Truder and Dorfmeister, Brian Eno, Leonard Cohen, 
Isaac Hayes, Sparks, the Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain, Bonobo, Moses, Mr. Scruff, Arrested Development, uh, Francois Kevorkian, uh, Elusive Nation, Chris Coco, Roger Eno, Lemon Jelly, Fragile State, Fridge, Tom Middleton, Mark Pritchard, Lowell Hammond, Neil Cowley Trio, Eva Abraham, DF Tram, uh, uh, Foy Vance, Laura Veers, Low Dollboy, Different Drummer, Glenn Tilbrook, wow, and the Fluffers, Nancy Wallace, Chilled by Nature, Martha Wainwright, Lego Beast, Baby Mammoth, Pan Electric, Express 2, The Memory Band, AIM, um, Nick Luscombe, Daft Pink, Patan, Ben Minot, Andrew Cronshaw, Blue Man Group, Rodrigo y Gabriela, Ursula Rucker, Nicola Willis and the Soul Investigators, Lenny Bazaar, The Persuasions, uh, Instrumental, David Toot, Scanner, Larry Hurd, Giles Peterson, Raina Truby, Andreas Vollenfeder, I hope I pronounced that right, Luke Vibert, BJ Cole, who played with Pan Electric on uh, one year, uh, Bellowhead, Orteca, Amy Winehouse, Talvin Singh, State of Bengal, Tiger Moth, Martin Carthy, Adrian Legg, Amadou and Miriam, uh, Mariam, Vashti Bunyan, The Bays, Jose Gonzalez, Jose Patilla, Sheila, Chandra, Bent, Kenobi, uh, Muffle Visions, AJ Netty, Ulrich Schnaus, Kirsty Hawkshaw, Harold Budd, Another Fine Day, Emily Davis, Robert Fripp, Robert Miles, Bollywood Brass Band, Pork Recordings, Fila Brasilia, Nightmares on Wax, Akers and G, DJ Food, DJ Derek, The Gentle People, Hexstatic, The Mad Professor, LTJ Bookham, Lee Perry, The Beat, The Wurzels, Jerry Dammers, Nine Lazy Nine, Boozy, Boozu Baju, <laughs> Jimmy Tenor, Scritti Politti, Funky Porcini, Roots Maneuver, uh four hero mark mac oh sorry they go four hero mark mac four hero jimster robert owens a man called adam pole roitzot played nitin sawney howie b bad martian shree greg wilson blue state slam chop quartet hot chip milo hot eight brass band jamie little the proclaimers sebastian tellier blue mar 10 yam yam morris fulton john shuckleworth kevin Rowland, beauty room lunds Fat Freddy's Drop, Tidarivan, uh, the Esborn Svensson Trio, the Heritage Orchestra, Diodato, Richie Havens, wow, Richie Havens, Tonto's Expanding Headband, Oi Vai Voi, Piano Circus, C6 Steve, The Scatterlights, The Blockheads, my guitar teacher played in the original Blockheads, St. Etienne, Charles Webster, Richard Norris, Bowler, The Necks, Kate Rubsby, The Swingles, uh, Ojos de Brujo, Ralph Myers and the Jack Heron Band, Square Pusher, Gotan Project, Future Sound of London, Nouvelle Vague, Michael Rainboth, Orbital, Guilty Pleasures, DJ Crush, Quantic, Try Thoughts, Herbert the Bees, Alice Russell, uh, Upstairs Recordings, Eight Pool Records, Biosphere, Echo Strings, Pitch Black, Jazzanova, London Electricity, Andrea Parker, Eamon Tobin, Spring Hill Jack, International Observer, Crazy P, Phase Action, Tung, Lamb, uh, Peche, Bigger Bush, Zion Train, Sounds from the Ground, Monkey Pilot, Wish Mountain, Emiliana Torini, Amber, Ian O'Brien, Terry Callier, played with Terry Callier with Neil, uh, Neil Cowley, Fragile State, John Metcalf, Boom Click, Glimpse, Rebirth Brass Band, The Next, Jenny Saint, Mao, Victor Davis, Charlie Gillett, Johnny Trunk, these are just the ones you could remember. I'm sure there's more, but that's pretty phenomenal. Some amazing uh, memories in there. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Well, we've gone well over time. So um, I was going to. How, how long were we supposed to be uh, on this call for? Well, there was talk of us just doing an hour, but we're close to two now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I reckon we should carry on, yeah. Chunking, James has said chunking. Did I, did I miss them off? Yeah, they were great. I, I think right. maybe we need a part two, Bruce. Yeah. I think you're right, Katrina. Just have a social, have a, have a yeah. social one. Let's slow down, speed up. Remember, yeah. Let's not burn ourselves <laughs> out tonight. We've got a ton of pictures and videos as well. Yeah, right? loads, of, loads of pictures, vids, you know. Yeah. We could be on here for days. <laughs> well, let's do a weekend where we can have some tunes and some videos. That would be really good. Yeah, it's yeah. a good idea. 
perhaps we could share afterwards a link to all the videos and maybe Stuart yeah. could share a link to the the, the um, Kung Fu on the beach, etc. Be great. I've got a thread on my Facebook for anyone who's on Facebook. So if they want to share anything else there, there's a couple of threads. Henry's asking, can we have a real life one? <laughs> I think that means, can we do another big chill? No. 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 <laughs> I'll tell you what, Henry, if you want to organise the whole thing, we'll just turn up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> And I only say no because it was of its time. And sometimes going back, you, I, I think it would be very hard to sort of bring it to that point when we lost it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's an astonishing archive of memories that you have. Well, thank you for um, thank you for hosting, Matt. And well, I, I started. I mean, you guys did what we really needed you to do, which was to just get chatting. So um, a pleasure, a pleasure. I'm really proud and happy to have been a part of it in a very small way. I always felt like I was sort of on the fringes, but, um, you know, going through this and just hearing the stories and seeing the photographs, I remember how, how much a big impact it had on my life. It really did. It was a I'd, I'd like to give a huge impact. And to we're friends, you know, we're still in touch. Great. I just, there's two people I'd like to give a big thank you to. Um, it's our kids, Ella and Joey. I know Ella apparently are on the call. I'm sure you'll be calling me after because uh, we were the parents building this huge thing and uh, not always there. So we thank you immensely for still yeah. loving us. Very much so. I'll echo that. Good to see you on the call, Ella. And a um, quick plug for Matt. You've got a new album out, haven't you? Panelectric. Yeah, just, just putting up... Um the pre-orders at the moment but yeah um music for a busy head volume four um you'll find me on facebook i'll be plugging it like crazy for the next couple of weeks and it should be You're ready band camp as well yeah yeah i'll have it up on band camp i'm literally in the process of getting it uploaded and, and what have you right now so it'll be ready for download at the end of the month um mostly ukulele and acoustic guitar can't wait yeah sounds great well, thank you, everyone. It's been amazing to see familiar faces and thank you for being part of this and um, helping us celebrate our birthday. See you in amazing. a field. The closest I'll be. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.